Hello, I'm Chris Mason, and I'm here to tell you today about some work that's been in our laboratory uh, using a lot of technologies uh, from Thermo Fisher, as well as uh, applied biosystems and other tools to really understand life and even to think about how ways we could you know, engineer life to eventually reach new worlds. So I'll walk you through a vision and plan that I've recently published called The Next 500 Years, Engineering Life to Reach New Worlds. So I'll start with a bit of a backdrop. Uh, in particular, you know, it's worth noting that more than ever, we are a spacefaring species. If you look at what's happened since Sputnik, since 1957, you can see there was a space race, of course, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s with the US and Russia. But more recently, we've seen a lot more uh, objects launched into space from other countries, including China. And it's really broken the record the past two years. We now have a, a super exponential phase where more and more objects are being launched into space and they're not just being put into space. You can see in the Chiang 4 mission on the far side of the moon, we saw cotton germinating really on the moon. So plants even on the moon, you can't yet get your lunar pants, but it's not too far away because we also know there's actually grants being given by ESA and NASA for lunar bases, little moon bases. Here's an architectural rendering by one firm that's building these over the next few years. So it's really extraordinary time in, uh, in humanity and really in a new space race 2.0 you can see here. And it's not just to stop at the moon. The goal is eventually to get to Mars. This is NASA's rendering of their plans to get there and, and really become a multi-planetary species. So this is actually something that's been fantasized about for hundreds of years and now is actually happening You know, in the next uh, probably 10 years where we actually might have boots on the red planet. And so that's one engine, I think, of development that's really extraordinary. But there's a second engine I want to tell you about today, which is in particular the ability to sequence DNA and, and at a really cheap rate has never been faster and never more powerful. So this is actually the cost to sequence one human genome. You'll see this slide in almost every geneticist slide deck because it's so extraordinary that something that used to be hundreds of millions of dollars is now less than $1,000, all in the course of really about 15 years. Just extraordinary pace of technology and faster than Moore's Law, really. This is the fastest that human technology has ever developed, actually. And so with that in mind, you know, that's it's, it's enabling all sorts of experiments to be done, discoveries. You can sequence anything really anywhere. This involves sequencing to find new kinds of human genes. The fundamental facets of human biology are still being found. You can see here the number of human genes is now annotated to be above 60,000. They're generally getting more and more as and continuously improving. And that's just in human cells. If you look at other cells, this is the discovery of new species over the past few hundred years. More and more are being found. Okay, well, maybe not birds. You can see birds, we've pretty much found most of the birds. They're kind of big and easy to spot. But beyond that, we're still finding new species with a variety of observational methods and sequencing methods across the kingdoms of life and domains of life. And this includes places like even the space station. We're picking up new bacteria that we and others have published that you could, you know, find them in their extraordinary resilience and could maybe even help us build that future on Mars. And so it's really extraordinary time uh, for biology. And this you know, means it's not just you know extraordinary because of the things you can discover, but the capacity for discovery is actually bigger on every single day than it is the day before, because the amount of data being made, it's cheaper to make data, you're making more of it every day, there's more data every day than any day before. That actually means that every day is actually the best day to be a geneticist. It doesn't mean you'll have the best day ever, but in terms of capacity for discovery, for annotation, for knowledge generation, every day is literally the best day empirically. So it's a pretty extraordinary time. And so, with that as a backdrop, these kind of two engines of discovery and, and, and ingenuity and really you know, just raw uh, power that we have now available to us technologically, I wanna walk you through a, a vision I originally penned as I started my lab 10 years ago, but now has come out as a book, is really for the next 500 years, what do I hope and actually think and in some ways know that we can do because we have examples where something that only 10 or 20 years ago was complete science fiction is now working today, either in my lab or in other labs around the world. So I wanna walk you through what happened in phase one and then where we are and where we're gonna go forward uh, in the next phases. So first, again, I was a, a young punk kid when I first wrote this. I was like, what should be the next phases of the lab? The first one should be annotation of the human genome, study outlier humans like astronauts and think about synthetic biology applications. And in the past 10 years, we've done just that. We uh, worked particularly on the NASA twin study as one of the labs leading the genetics uh, on this effort. And this is where Scott Kelly on the right went to space for a whole year and his brother, Mark Kelly on the left, which is now Senator Kelly, he stayed back on earth. And we did as many measurements as we possibly could for these twins. This is kind of the, what's called the NASA twin study. You can see I did manage to get epigenetics on the middle of that patch, those little circles on DNA. We did uh, sneak that in. And what we wanna do with this study is 
look at what would happen to the body and it's if it's in space for a full year and do it at a very fine grained molecular level and understand the changes in physiology, genetics, uh, and really uh, behavior during the course of the mission. And so when you don't know where to look in biology, in general, I think the best place to look is everywhere you can. So that's actually exactly what we did in this study is like, okay, changes could be in any modality of biology in any cell type at coming in any point. So we looked at six months pre-flight, one year in flight, and then post-flight in blood, vasculature, saliva, fecal samples, urine. You can see the restraint in this figure. We did not color the fecal uh, column uh, row there brown. We did manage to just uh, re re reserve uh, that, that ability and, and held back. Uh, there was a big debate in the lab meeting. But uh, you can see we wanted to study really almost every molecule, both human and microbial and otherwise, that we could during the mission. In particular, my lab focused on these kind of black bars here, these assays for the twin study. And so what we looked for in the study published a couple years ago was things that changed in concert, where you have multiple modalities of biology that move together, kind of like waves of response to spaceflight, and look for them to cluster together. And particularly we look, for example, for things that really increased in spaceflight dramatically and then also came back down. And we saw many changes. You can see cognitive changes, metabolites, microbiomes, you know, different species. We saw gene expression, proteomics, cytokines. We saw all these changes. But the one that was actually one of the more surprising ones is the fact that telomeres actually got longer in space. Now, telomeres, as you probably know, is a sign of, of longevity in youth because you have longer telomeres when you're younger. So this was the opposite of what we expected. We thought, given the stress on the body, that we thought his telomeres would get shorter on average uh, during the mission. But it's actually not what happened. He got longer telomeres, so kind of younger in a sense. And he also gained about two inches of height when he was up in space. Uh, and he lost weight. So this led some people to say, oh, my gosh, you know, space makes you taller and younger and you lose weight. You know, it sounds like the best diet ever, basically. But the, the height did you know, go away when he got back to Earth. Gravity took it away. And the telomeres did shrink back down when he got back to Earth. Uh, and he did gain some of the weight back. So it's not permanent. But it was intriguing because we thought, well, what's causing this? What's actually driving this inside of his body? So, again, we wanted to do a few things is look at. Does this occur in other astronauts to replicate it or other, other situations? And then what's the mechanism for it? What are we seeing and how it's driving that, basically? So the first thing we did is actually think, okay, is it the hypoxia maybe or the radiation or the stress on the body? Like, would you see the same thing, for example, if someone climbed Mount Everest? So we actually did just that and worked with uh, two twins, Matt Meniz and Willie Benegas, where they had their twins actually stay at sea level while they climbed Mount Everest and drew blood on the top of the mountain and brought it back down for analysis. And here we could actually see just like in the astronauts, we could see that they saw longer telomeres. You can see the data from the paper on the left. And also we confirmed this with 11 other astronauts with Susan Bailey, that they also get longer telomeres. So again, kind of a pretty surprising result, but in showing that the stress on the body is, uh, and, and also some of the uh, basically radiation, because you do get more radiation at, the, at flight at that height, really do seem to lead to this kind of peculiar longer telomere response. But then we wanted to look at what else was happening in the body. We took a look at genes that go up or go down, and up here you can see is orange and down is purple. And you can see these bursts of color show the specific genes are listed on there of when they actually are changing during flight and then after flight. And what we could see is it was genes for the immune system, DNA repair pathways, and even hypercapnia, which was kind of surprising because that's when you have too much carbon dioxide. And this was talked about by Scott Kelly in his book. He wrote a whole book about his year in space. And, and here, too, we you know, looked at the data from the space station. It seemed like it fluctuated, but wasn't too bad. And talked to other astronauts as well about how can you get hypercapnia if, if the airflow is so well regulated. And it turns out a lot of it's because air just moves differently in space than it does on Earth, as you can probably guess. But here, if you blow bubbles in space, for example, as best exemplified by Jack Fisher here, is that the bubble can stay in front of your face. So little clouds of mini CO2 were staying by their face and leading to some of the show up in the blood work which was kind of a surprising feature uh, of the space flight. So you can see here, this thing which has been talked about by astronauts for a long time is something we can actually pick up in the blood work of this hypercapnia result uh, during the mission as well as we've seen now for other astronauts uh, as well. So that's kind of some of the initial work I've described uh, in the book and thinking, okay, that's what's happening to the human body in space, but what else gets up there? Think about when we build spacecrafts and space stations, think about well, what are we sending up with them? That's not just the human biology, but there's microbial biology, right? So. If you actually go to Jet Propulsion Laboratories, you can see this is a picture of the spacecraft assembly facility where they actually build spacecraft. You can see here, for example, the Perseverance rover. You probably, if you remember, just last year landed on the surface of Mars. And, you know, when the engineers are building it, they take great care and caution to make sure there's very little or zero contamination as close to zero as possible. 
but engineers are people too, right? They might take a picture with the robot that they're sending to another planet. I can't really blame them. And it's kind of exciting. This is going to Mars, right? So they're gonna take a picture. But one of the interesting things about this is what's happening is right now, the Perseverance rover is collecting both surface and air samples for a Mars sample return mission. So basically the Perseverance rover is tooling around Mars, looking at craters like this, actually looking at the landscape. There's an actual picture from Mars. It looks very eerily Earth-like, you can see. And it's you know, poking around the soil, digging up into the regolith, collecting samples. And then we're going to be packaging them up and longingly looking back at Earth. This is actually what Earth looks like if you're on the surface of Mars uh, right near, near springtime. And eventually there will be this Mars sample return mission. By about 2032, in about 10 years, we'll get these physical samples back from Mars to look at. And we're going to actually characterize them, look at them, and you know, as best as we can, determine if there's maybe evidence of life there, maybe use mass spec methods to try and characterize what's in these samples. But one of the first questions we'll have is, well, you know, if we see nucleic acids, what if we just had some DNA that was left over from the face microbiome of this guy or, you know, the, or this girl, these people that work on the mission? So we've actually been sequencing the clean room to do just that. We have a, basically a genetic catalog of what's anything that's in this clean room, as well as anything that's ever been seen from any of the databases on Earth with a project we've built out as a protocol called Metagraph with a, a, a project called Metasub that sequences in subways all over the world. So we actually have this planetary scale catalog of every nucleic acid that's ever been observed. And the first thing we're gonna do in 10 years when these samples come back and get sequenced is compare everything we've ever observed in the clean rooms, in the astronauts, or anywhere we've seen in the world from our databases and all public databases and compare it to what we see that might be coming from Mars. It's actually really the beginning of planetary scale genomics. We're starting to actually examine these kinds of questions. So that's kind of the, where we're at for the end of phase one. It's really extraordinary scale of genetic data and map mapping of biology and biological function. But when I think about looking ahead, sort of the second phase, I was thinking, how do we go from just measuring biology and mapping it and quantifying it, which is fine and interesting. Of course, we're still discovering things every day but doing a more active approach. How do we go to actually defending the biology that might be at risk? And so this gets us into what I think is happening now in my lab and we'll go for the next several decades is we'll start to move in new elements into genomes. We'll have more astronaut studies and we'll actually hopefully get boots on Mars in this time frame. And the reason we have to think about tweaking cells is because we know what happens to DNA when you're in space. This is a plot that shows the amount of 8-oxoguanosine. This over here you can see is damaged DNA, literally broken ladders of your, of your genetic code coming out exuded in the urine. And you can see flight day 15, 30 onward, you can see during the flight, it spikes up and comes back down when they get back to Earth. But this is across 59 astronauts that we've examined. You can continuously see damaged DNA. And that's, that's just uh, on the space station, right? That's in low Earth orbit. That's not even that far away. If you look at, for example, the amount of millisieverts, the radiation dose that Scott Kelly got here in light blue was 146 millisieverts. It's much more than, say, you know, CAT scan or X-rays you can see down here, uh, but not as much as, say, watching an atomic bomb test. But Mars would be much harder in red, you can see. If you go there and back, potentially a three-year mission, you're looking at 1,200 millisieverts, actually 1 1.2 sieverts. That's more than the recommended dose for your entire life for astronauts. And so it would definitely be hard. And so we have to think about really interesting questions. For example, you know, can we physically and pharmacologically, but also genetically protect astronauts? That's really, I think, intriguing question. But it also begs the question, well, should we do such a thing? What are the ethics of actually modifying humans to get them ready for another planet? And we do know, for example, one way you shouldn't do this is to secretly CRISPR embryos and then have them be born and then release the babies onto the world. Hey, Jing Kui went to jail for this, and I think rightly so. And what we've been doing is kind of the opposite. So we think about... How do we actually pre prevent you know, misappropriation of ideas and funds and technologies and actually build genomes in, in the public eye and have it be very transparent? So we do this with the Genome Project Right Consortium, which is one of the projects we work on in lab. And we also think about ways to apply this. So you think you might be thinking about like modifying humans and modifying cells and, and putting them into people might sound a little bit confusing, but it's actually already happening. We have ongoing chimeric engine receptor T cell trials called CAR T trials. This is one of the sites that we have in Hangzhou. We're actually taking cells from patients, making a modified system, modified chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell, growing the cells up, reinfusing them back into the patient, and then actually curing cancer in some cases. A really extraordinary, powerful technology being used today of modified genomes in patients. And it's not just one or two trials. There's actually dozens and dozens of trials using CRISPR or other gene editing methods you can see here just in the past five, 10 years, and more and more of them are coming. So it's really extraordinary time to start thinking about modifying uh, genomes and cells therapeutically, and eventually we can use this exact same technology like it's in our lab and others to actually protect other cells. It's a really extraordinary time. 
So that gets us, uh, you know, moving, you know, get a little bit more vague as we go, you know, farther into the future here. But there's other ideas of, well, if we start to really do human trials on genome engineering, we have to make sure we can fix and monitor off target effects. But we can also get creative. We can start to think about other ideas of genome engineering. So, for example, P53 is the guardian of the genome. It senses DNA damage and, and prepares cells for uh, basically replication. But most people have two copies of P53. But what if you had 20 copies, for example, like the African elephant? It has a lower risk of cancer. And we know this can be put inside human cells. And so that's interesting, right? So we could take examples from other organisms and use their genes and their genetic profile to maybe improve human cells. So for example, tardigrades, these cute little water bears, we know that they uh, can actually help a reduction in DNA damage when you temporarily put it into a human cells. So one thing we've done in my lab is we made a permanently transfected cell line uh, that actually we can see this D sub protein from tardigrades now in a chimeric human cell has this new protein that helps with uh, mapping to double strand breaks helps repair it, and leads to about an 80% reduction in that 8-oxoguanosine, that same damage base we see in astronauts. We know we can prevent it if we put it in human cells. And so this is, you know, again, not in astronauts yet, but we know we can do this in cells, and we're in doing you know, many more ways to optimize this for genetic engineering and CRISPR in genomes. But we're also looking at other ways to do this, so we don't have to just modify the genome. If you think of the fabric of life, you could actually change the threads or just change when they get used. In particular, there's epigenetic methods that use modifications of CRISPR, where you can usually change the histones or the DNA methylation uh, landscapes to change when genes go on and off. And indeed, we're doing this as well as DARPA, where they can preemptively express a protective allele. So if you know you're going into a radiological hazard zone, just temporarily turn on the genes that you need and then turn them back off later. It's kind of like having genes for the weekend, if you will. Uh, and this is something else I think that opens up a new avenue uh, of therapy uh, for actually thinking about what you could do when you go to other planets. Okay, so then we get to phase four is where we might actually be able to test, test protected human genomes in space environments. This is a picture of the Mars base camp that will eventually be orbiting uh, Mars and being built by Lockheed Martin. And so if you think going into this fourth phase, you could think about, you know, really, could we imagine other things to add in to protect genomes and other ideas from evolution? So for example, could we end molecular ineptitude in a variety of ways? So my, one of my favorite examples is we all still carry the gene for vitamin C in our genome. It's just a pseudogene. It's been deactivated and mutated over years, over, over millions of years, but it's still there. So vitamin C autosynthesis was lost among some mammals, but it's still there in some other ones. You can see in, in uh, bold here, these mammals all still carry, these mammals and animals all carry the gene to make their own vitamin C. They don't have to worry about scurvy. They don't have to get their vitamin C from their margaritas, but some of them do drink margaritas like dogs. But we still have the gene inside of us. It's just been broken. So what if we repair it? What if we fix it? This is something that we know works in other primates and other mammals that we can do, and I think should do, especially for long-term space flight. But if you're going to think about that, well, think about this. We also have nine essential amino acids, meaning you have to get them from your diet or you will not live. But this also seems uh, unfair and unjust, right? So why is that? We know actually the exact enzymes needed from other organisms that could actually make all of the amino acids from precursors in our cells. Why don't we make this? And here's something I detail in the book that actually very clearly we could. We know the exact pathways we'd need to engineer to make this a reality. And this starts to get into other interesting areas. Well, could we repair disease genes? Could if you have a risk for disease, just get rid of it altogether? And this has been done to some degree. For example, the repair of genes for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy within embryos. And if you're having this kind of cellular liberty, you could do anything with your cells and fix them and not be subject to the genetic lottery you get, but also you could combine your cells with anyone else in any way. So for example, could you have same-sex parents, two mom and two dead children by reprogramming cells to make egg and sperm even from skin cells? Or could you have three parent children? Indeed, we know you can for mitochondrial donors. This has already been done. Or for example, what if you have uterine cancer and you want to have some of your cells be used outside of your body and maybe have a uh, an extra uterine system or an exo womb. This has been done actually for, um, you can see here, different uh, is different goats and also sheep that's been tried on where you can actually have an entire extra uterine system to continue gestation outside of the, of the body of the mother. And so what I think this gives you is actually cellular liberty from the very first cell, meaning you're not beholden to just the lottery you got at birth. And this does, of course, raise some big ethical questions. So you can imagine here um, that, um, that, you know, can we really select the best embryos uh, you know, in the sense like, you know, this has been critiqued by many because, of course, it's a big uh, ethical question is that, you know, we uh, if you can if you put your genes together and actually think you can pick the best embryo, that is not so simple. You know, it sounds simple. You can have polygenic risk scores 
where you take trade, take different genetic loci, try and find those that are the lowest risk, combine them. And, you know, conceptually, it's simple. You have a high polygenic risk score. That's too high risk. You want to optimize for a low polygenic risk score. And that seems simple enough and straightforward enough. But we know that it can lead to a biased prediction if you have imperfect measures. So, for example, if you just want to say, what's my risk of schizophrenia? This has been shown by others that it's more associated with ancestry, whether you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, otherwise, than it is actually with your polygenic risk score for schizophrenia. So there's a lot of work to be done. It's not quite there yet, but we know we can uh, model it better. And I think we can even model it in the context of not just what is your risk as an individual, but we should also think about what does this mean in society? What is the cost of a treatment? And actually, how well can we do it? So it's too early to do this, I think, today, but the data will get better and the methods will get better. And they have to, I think, include socioeconomic measures and culture measures as well. And so you think, okay, that's, you know, selecting embryos, but can you actually have selection and creates a different trait, a different animal over time? Well, some of this too, we know can be done. If you've never heard of the silver fox experiment, it's extraordinary. They took foxes that were the aggressive ones and let them die of old age and took the more playful, docile foxes and saw, could they become dogs? And within about 40 years, they started to change some of their facial features. They got shorter snouts, they became more playful. One of the students in my lab, Lenore Pipes, even looked at some of the brains of the more tame animals versus the aggressive. You can see their brains had changed over time. So we know it actually is possible to have directed evolution and within a matter of decades, get really take foxes and turn them into dogs. We know this is possible. It's extraordinary. So looking a bit further in the future, so in phase five, it'll get a little bit more short and brief here, but then we can think about going to other planets and even going to things like, you know, Europa's clipper is going to go there to an alien ocean. Or for example, build new genomes from scratch. We know this has been possible. It's been done for E. coli. And at this point, we could get more creative. Like what if we actually wanted to have for, you know, chloral humans or photosynthetic skin, could we do such a thing? I think we very much could. You know, maybe you're laying by a pool someday and you were like, oh, I'm hungry. I'd like to lay out my skin and get enough sun so I could actually get enough energy for the day. How much skin would you need? Uh, I've done the math on this. And you, if you lay outside for about an hour, what you need is about two full tennis courts worth of skin to get enough energy to last for the rest of the day. Uh, of course, it's going to be hard to make sure uh, you know that your chloroplasts are stable inside your skin. It hasn't been done yet, but it's interesting to think about. And at least we know what the number is uh, these days. It's kind of fun to think about. And it does still seem weird. You think like you know green humans and chloroplasts and, and, and mammalian cells, and it seems like you know aliens inside of our cells. Except that if you think we know that some of this has already been done. For example, human pig chimera embryos have been created, and even uh, variations of combining primate embryos has already been done. Even other organisms like delayed rotifers, these interesting creatures, they're called an evolutionary scandal because they have life without sex, which is as awful, I think, as it sounds until you realize why they're doing it. They're doing it to actually survive on borrowed DNA, to eat DNA, and then use that DNA in these very temporary fashions, which again, seems peculiar and weird until you look at, you know, look in the mirror, 8% of the human genome is old dead retroviruses embedded in all of our cells. And so this is not as alien as it actually sounds. So looking further ahead, we actually would take lessons from extremophiles that can survive in these really peculiar places. So we have a project in the lab called the Extreme Microbiome Project, where we can see different organisms have the ability to survive in these very peculiar and different places. And so we want to use these as lessons to think about, well, what could survive, for example, on the space station? Or, for example, what maybe could survive on the surface of Titan? You know, this is what Titan looks like. And could we eventually seed these plants with organisms that might be able to survive? By this time in the, in the plan, actually, we very much could be able to do just that. By eventually phase seven, we could send these new genomes to seed Earth-like plants. You know, we think about sending people to Mars and eventually having Mars be self-reliant, which would be great. And this is something I and many others have written about. But long term, you want to think we want to have planetary liberty. You don't just want to be just on one planet. You actually want to have more than one place that you can go. Because if you engineer a genome to only live on one planet, you've actually decreased the planetary liberty. You're not letting it go to multiple planets. And what's amazing is, you know, 30 years ago, we knew of almost no planets around other stars, exoplanets. But in the past, for several decades, we now have thousands of planets that have been discovered. You can see here the summary. And a lot of them look a lot like Earth. You can see these kind of this Earth similarity index. Some of them are very similar in size and shape and, and luminosity from their relative sun to Earth. And this is creating something called an ESI, or the Earth Similarity Index. And so the closer you are to Earth, the more like you are in this figure to be purple or blue. And Mars, you can see, it's not even that good. It's, it's not really that close to Earth, but it's, you know, it's okay. It's close to us physically. But there's a lot of other planets within five parsecs, or you can see here within 15 parsecs, all these planets that are good candidate planets. And if you look out a little bit farther, you can see 20 parsecs. If you look out at the galaxy, this is our galaxy from the top and from the side. Here's all the exoplanets that have been found. And look at all these little purple and little blue dots, these are basically plants that we could go to and possibly today survive, make it and actually live there. And it might be liquid water, it might be difficult, but we could actually go. And we just started looking really in the past 10 to 15 years. 
And so this means that by the end of the 500 year plan, we get to the point where getting towards the end, we could actually start to have generation ships that would go towards these new worlds. Like have people, multiple generations live and die on the same spacecraft on the way to another planet. And what I hope is, and described you know, very much in this book, is that all the technology from the past 70 years out looking forward of the developmental biology, ep genetic technologies, transplantation methods, and looking out in the future, we'd eventually be able to launch a generation ship and maybe have colonized and, and landed on most of the solar system. So the biggest question I get, and I might think, well, this is this sounds sounds lovely, and I, I'm excited by it, clearly, but uh, the biggest question I get is, is why do this? And we have other challenges here on Earth. We have poverty. There's you know economic disparities and structural inequities and problems in society. But there's real clear reasons I think to do this. It's inspiring for people. It gives us uh, makes it so we have a backup plan for the humanity potentially. It makes it so that I think we can develop new technology on the way. We can do it and also solve social and economic problems at the same time. But there's a bigger reason why that I want to close with today, which is that the biggest reason is actually we know that life is fragile. We know that, for example, even our civilization is destroying microbial life. We know that, for example, birds, about a quarter of them have vanished in the past 50 years in North America. They're dying from habitat destruction. And this is not the first time. If you look in the past 500 million years, there's been at least five major extinctions in a world both with and without polar ice caps. You can see here as much as 96% of all species have died from a mass extinction whenever the temperature changes too fast. And you can see here, we're worried about today making it go up too fast so we don't create another mass extinction. And what's interesting about this though, is there's an extraordinary plot. It's 500 million years of life on this planet. But if you zoom out a little bit and take what this plot is and kind of put it in the proper context of where we are in the past and likely future of Earth, we're actually in this very nice but temporary temperature canyon. And about, you know, when we get to about a billion years, from now, the sun will get so hot it'll boil the oceans. And so actually, we don't have you know four, million, 4 billion years until the sun engulfs the planet. That'll be much worse and much hotter, you can see. But the actual oceans will boil off. And we know if we think about the fragile, fragility of life, you can see we think of it normally as these three types. There's producers and consumers and there's decomposers. And what we've all thought since elementary school is these major facets and types of organisms. But what I argue today is that this is missing a really key feature. There's actually a fourth distinct kind of organism, which is the only kind of organisms that can be aware of the frailty of this ecosystem, really only things that can guard against it, or the guardians, quite frankly, of the galaxy, or even of the universe. And that's only us, only humans, as far as we know, are the only species in the entire universe that are aware of the frailty of life and can actually prevent it. You know, of course, we can cause extinction and don't have a perfect track record, but we're the only ones that can actually take endangered species like this one and actually bring them back to health or even potentially take species that have gone extinct and even bring them back, which we're working also in the lab and also working with George Church and Colossal on this. And so this is an extraordinary, I argue, duty for all of us is to, for both present and future, but even past life, to serve as guardians and shepherds and stewards of life itself is the big answer to the question why. And if you look far enough ahead, you might think, well, but eventually, wouldn't the, we just go to a different star and another star and ad infinitum? At some point, do we prevent the implosion or heat death or big rip of the universe or allow destruction of the universe in the hope that life might rise again? And in this case, the answer to that question, I think, is that we would still uh, survive. There's no guarantee that life will come up again in the next version of the universe, or uh, maybe this is the only one that ever happens. So I think we'd even fundamentally look at restructuring the nature of the universe if it's in trillions of years from now and see if we would still survive. And I think we could, and I think we should. And so that's my argument for the uh, reason as to why we should do it and uh, the ways we can do it in the next 500 years. So with that, uh, thank you all for coming on the journey. I want to thank a lot of the twins, PIs, and the collaborators at NASA and SpaceX who made this work possible. I want to thank the astronauts themselves who actually get to pick their own posters. So thanks, Scott Kelly, and a lot of the members of the crew. And of course, I, I couldn't be standing here without the lab, which is extraordinarily inspiring and wonderful group. This is some of our older pictures. This is a more recent picture where people were vaccinated, much happier. And of course, thanks funding from uh, NASA, from WorldQuant, uh, from Trish, as well as the Gates Foundation and the NIH. And thanks again to many colleagues, friends, collaborators uh, across many, many disciplines, industry, academic, government supporters who make this work possible. Thanks again to uh, Applied Biosystems and Thermo for having me. And I'll close with a thought of what Ernest Shackleton asked for people in 1914, was that it was a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, but honor and recognition in case of success. And I think we are asking uh, m no less than this and much more for some of the pioneering astronauts and people that are playing these Mars missions and things that are ahead of us. But uh, just as, uh, and I think even more exciting than what happened 100 years ago, uh, when they got scurvy on their way to Antarctica, some of them, so we can now actually prevent that. So thanks so much for your time and uh, pleasure to be here.